on this edition of the Fifth Estate. Ten years later, we're back at Rana Plaza, back in Bangladesh. In 2013, more than 1,100 people died here making your clothes. Do you recognize these shorts? A decade later, we reconnect with a worker who survived this massive factory collapse. You've had such a huge sacrifice in your life just to make clothes for Canadians. And what about the Canadian brand at the centre of the disaster? I'm troubled that our company can still be part of such an unspeakable tragedy. Were their promises forgotten, like the site of the tragedy itself? They don't have any money for their medical that they need to take care of. So to not have them done that many years later is shocking. We're in Bangladesh on the hunt for answers. This factory makes clothes for Joe Fresh, a Canadian company. And these are the inspection reports. Yeah. And you've had ongoing fire safety issues. We'll show you the price the workers continue to pay to make the clothes you wear. Do you have enough money to eat? My name is Mark Kelly. I'm with uh, the Fifth Estate. So we have been trying to get in touch with you for a couple of weeks. I'm Mark Kelly. This is the Fifth Estate. It was as quick as it was deadly. In 90 agonizing seconds, Rana Plaza collapsed. Built illegally on a swamp, it was a death trap. Even after workers detected gaping cracks in the foundation, they were ordered back into the building hours before it collapsed. <laughs> 1,134 people died here. About 2,500 more were injured, some for life. Making clothes for best-selling brands like Benetton, Zara, Walmart, and Loblaw-owned Joe Fresh. It was that Canadian connection that brought me here 10 years ago. And it's brought me back to find out what, if anything, has changed for the people who make the clothes you wear. Our first stop, Rana Plaza. It's upsetting to see this because I remember when I was here 10 years ago, the family members were coming up with pictures of their loved ones who were lost, buried in the rubble, people who were bodies were never recovered. And today, it's like a garbage dump. It's just forgotten. It's like the whole disaster itself, all those people, all those lives lost, just simply forgotten. If not for this tired looking monument, you wouldn't know this is the site of the deadliest garment factory collapse in modern history. The site is used as an open toilet, marred by mounds of scraps from a neighboring garment factory. Business booms as memories fade. Ten years ago, I remember meeting a Rudy Rani Dash. She spent days trapped in the rubble. Her mother died in the disaster. A Rudy lost her lower leg. She was 17 years old. A Rudy sewed 150 pocket seams an hour, making these Joe Fresh shorts for Canadians. How do you feel when when you look at those pants? I feel sad. If I didn't work in that factory, this would not have happened. I feel very bad seeing these pants. She said then she couldn't work anymore. So we wanted to know. How is she surviving today? Hey, it's all right.
it's so nice to see you after 10 years, but I'm curious to know, how are you? How are you feeling? How, how is your life these days? She now goes by the name Shumi Akhtar after marrying and converting to Islam. She's the mother of an eight-year-old. The world was paying attention 10 years ago and said that they, we cared about the workers like you. Do you feel you've been forgotten now? Our broken lives and broken promises, the legacy of Rana Plaza, we wanted to find out. In the aftermath of the collapse, there was outrage. In Canada, one brand in particular found itself in the crosshairs of condemnation. This was a senseless tragedy. It should not have happened. Loblaw President Galen Weston acknowledged Joe Fresh clothes were being made in Rana Plaza. I'm troubled that despite a clear commitment to the highest standards of ethical sourcing, our company can still be part of such an unspeakable tragedy. Back in 2013, we investigated those high standards. We got a prison interview with Buzlus Samad Adnan. Jailed after the collapse, Joe Fresh paid him $6 million a year to make clothes for them at Rana Plaza. And yet he could not name one Loblaw employee who had ever visited his factory. Weston promised to put Loblaw staff on the ground in Bangladesh. That means uh, an increased number of interactions with these facilities. Uh, it means spot checks uh, at a higher frequency. In a statement, Loblaw also promised long-term and direct financial compensation for the victims and their families. Our priority is to do what's right for those affected by the tragedy. Loblaw then signed on to a landmark accord with other international brands that would force companies in Bangladesh to fix their safety problems or lose the business. You may have thought the Rana disaster would be bad for business in Bangladesh, but far from it. Garment exports have more than doubled in the past decade, employing more than four million people. So the stakes couldn't be higher for this country to reassure the world, this is a safe place to make your clothes. The accord ushered in an era of independent inspections for fire, electrical, and structural safety. And the group was led by a Canadian. The magnitude of the task, I think, was entirely lost on me. Winnipeg's Brad Lowen is a fire protection engineer who had never set foot in Bangladesh before. How many buildings did you encounter that had structural issues that, that, that could have made them the next Rana Plaza? Boy, I would say in the end it was uh, in the order of 50. 50 that we needed to evacuate sort of within hours of our doing our initial inspection. Yeah. Fire safety was an issue too. In 2012, as many as 120 people died in a fire at the Tazreen factory in Bangladesh. Doors were blocked by boxes. The building lacked fire exits. And then fire protection wise, which was, um, horrendous, like very unsafe. These, these um, buildings were fire traps. Yeah, yeah. Lowen was handed a list of 1,700 factories and given one year to inspect them all. So we would send in uh, uh, three teams of engineers. Over half of these factories had locks on their exit doors, and we, we made them cut them off. 
But when Lowen threatened to close factories until they fixed their problems, he said he got pushback from the brands. I would get calls from the sourcing people and saying, well, no, we, we're, we're happy to pull out of that factory if you're saying it's unsafe. Our order should be done in two weeks and then we will pull out. And I said, no, 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 no. But they also had to learn quite quickly that yes, in fact, if these factories were that immediately dangerous that they weren't gonna finish their two week run of jeans or what have you that it was right now. Well, were you surprised that the brands were pushing back when they had signed uh, on right? to this? Yes, yeah, to the extent, um, yes, I was surprised. I'm told that there was a, a, a movement behind the scenes to get you fired. Um, yeah, well, I don't know what your source is on that. I wouldn't A very, be, very good one. Okay. I wouldn't be surprised, but the fact is they couldn't just outright do it. In the 10 years since the Rana disaster, fewer than 75 garment workers have died on the job. A phenomenal change has happened in the last 10 years. And that has happened because of the accord. Kalpona Actor started working in garment factories as a 12-year-old. Today, she's one of the country's fiercest advocates for workers' rights. So this is the first time someone counted workers as a human and worker, not like any other equipment. Factory owners didn't have a voice on the Accord's steering committee, but they did have a voice in Parliament. At the time of the collapse, about 30 of the country's 300 MPs owned a garment factory. So that's why from the day one, they didn't like their court. And they are within the government, so they were able to make government understand that a court ruining the industry. One owner, whose factory was shut down after he was accused of falsifying structural safety records, took the accord to court. A judge then kicked the accord out of the country. Yeah, the, the courts decided through a case brought by a factory owner that the accord was no longer welcome. It was clear that that factory owners, you know, ran the show, very influential. A new inspection system would be put in place with one major difference. The powerful factory owners would help oversee it. When we come back. Every day workers are going to work in these buildings that have potentially life-threatening situations, hazards. Isn't this a concern? Yes, it is. But uh, has anything happened? No, nothing has happened. Are you waiting for something to happen? We're in Bangladesh. Marking 10 years since the collapse of Rana Plaza. The anger, the profound sense of loss still present here today. It was a tragedy that killed 1,134 people. We want to know, are the people who make our clothing any safer today? Bangladesh now has a new building safety inspection agency. We've been invited to tour a factory with their inspectors. This is Apillion Knitwares. With 22,000 workers, one of the biggest garment making companies in Bangladesh. About 1,200 workers have been called to a meeting to go over safety protocols. Urged to speak out if they see any workplace dangers. And while this feels in part like a performance for the inspectors, the message is clear. This is the new and improved Bangladesh. What was your memory of Rana Plaza uh, 10 years ago? Very painful memory. The feeling was sadness, urgency, need of change, all these things put together. Abdul Haq heads the new agency called the RSC. He's the new sheriff in town after the international safety agency, the Accord, was kicked out of Bangladesh in 2020. If the Accord was so effective and helped improve building safety, why is it gone? 
good question. They did not involve the garments industry from the very beginning. It's true, factory owners weren't included in the decision making at the Accord, but that was by design. They were the ones being policed. So they were not liking the policing approach anymore. Of course, the factory owners, were, were, they didn't like the fact that there was this policing agency that was telling them to clean up their act. Why do the factory owners get to decide whether the Accord stays or goes? It's the uh, Bangladesh uh, justice system decided, not the factory owners. Based on a complaint and a case filed by the factory owners. Well, I think um, change is the name of the game. So it is a change for the better? It, it is change for the better. Is it really change for the better? We did our own digging to find out. One of the most active Canadian clothing companies in Bangladesh is Loblaw-owned Joe Fresh. Our team took a close look at the inspection reports for the 21 factories they've used since 2019. Some serious safety concerns were raised in the reports. One factory had an antiquated fire alarm system that took years to be updated. Another factory used by Joe Fresh had a missing sprinkler system in 2017. The issue is currently listed in a report as pending verification. And then there's Meditex Industries. It has a long list of safety concerns. We asked Loblaw for an introduction to the factory owners so we could visit. Loblaw's reply, we are unable to at this time. This factory makes clothes for Joe Fresh, a Canadian company. So we decided to show up and ask for a visit ourselves. The manager came out to meet us. That's what we wanted to talk to you about, and this is from uh, the RSC, and these are the inspection reports. Yeah. And you've had ongoing fire safety issues. According to a 2014 safety report, inspectors found 20 serious fire violations, including the failure to test and maintain the fire alarm system, locked emergency exit doors, and emergency exit stairs that empty inside the building instead of safely outside. Then seven more serious fire-related issues identified during four different follow-up inspections. That only closed. Fire safety issue already closed. So all are closed. Can you show us that these are? No, actually, uh, today we, you have no appointment here. So we could not. Uh, we, we tried to. We tried to get an appointment with with Lobla, no, and they said Lobla. that they won't help us. The most recent inspection report from 2021, the 13th follow-up, lists four outstanding issues. Those emergency stairs still exiting inside the building instead of out. The factory's plan for fixing these issues, all listed as pending verification. Eventually, we're asked to leave the factory. Outside, the situation got tense. We were filming the building from the street. What's happening? When security tried unsuccessfully to confiscate our drone. We then wanted to speak to workers to ask if they had any safety concerns making clothes here for Canadians. We're told that after we had a meeting with the manager on the inside, he had a very stern warning for the employees that as they leave for lunch, as they are now, don't talk to the Canadian journalists. And it's critical to life safety in the factory. So to not have them done that many years later is shocking. We took our findings to Brad Lowen, the safety expert. I mean, you can build and rebuild buildings from scratch, obviously, in a lot less than eight years. Just no excuse, really, for, for not having those things done um, that many years on. Every day, workers are going to work in these buildings that have potentially life-threatening situations, hazards, in those factories. Today, as we speak today, they are going to work there. Isn't this a concern? 
Yes, it is. But uh, has anything happened? No, nothing has happened. Are you waiting I'm, for something to happen? No, I'm not. Nothing is perfect. We are not perfect. But we're getting better and better and better and better and stronger and stronger and stronger. My question is, why that Canadian company is still doing business with that factory? Did you ask them that? It's a fair question. We must do a much better job to ensure the safety of workers producing our products in Bangladesh and around the world. Especially given statements made by Joe Fresh founder Joe Mimran after the Rana collapse in 2013. We are establishing a new standard at Loblaw. Any Loblaw brand's product produced for sale by us must be made in a facility that respects all local construction and building codes. In all 21 factories used by Loblaw since 2019, we counted the number of safety violations while they were doing business there. The total, 176. We asked Loblaw about the recent concerns uncovered at the factories. They sent us a statement saying they had since stopped using two of them, adding, the work to ensure safe factories is an active and dynamic process and one that we take extremely seriously. Lobla adds it has seven employees on the ground to conduct their audits at each factory. Still, concerns about safety oversight remain. In 2023, the Centre for Policy Dialogue in Bangladesh said the quality of inspections is slipping under the RSC noting a recent increase in workplace accidents, an increase in factory fires, as well as indirect pressure from employers and government agencies that is preventing RSC inspectors from conducting an independent assessment. The successor of the code are not running in the same way the code used to run in here. So it's, 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 it's a totally different. So the brands, I would say, you know, uh, inside of them, they were happy when it has been kicked out. None of this comes as a surprise to workers' rights activist Kalpona Akhtar. Who is holding the factory owners accountable? Who's making them clean up their act? Uh, it should be the brands and it should be the RSC board of directors. Uh, we can ask them this, this question that what the hell happening? Mm. So you say it should be, but is that actually happening? I don't think so. That's why, you know, we lost our confidence on the RSC. When we come back, the workers' struggle to survive turns into a fight for their lives. I went to visit a worker. At the end of the month, she can barely afford enough food to eat. She's sleeping on a floor. Is this a way to treat somebody in a profitable industry? These are the people who make your clothes in Bangladesh, taking to the streets in 2023 because they say they're underpaid and perpetually poor. There were many bloody clashes between police and protesters. This is the dark side of those cheap and cheerful clothes we buy. This is a garment workers protest that has come here to the site of the Rana Plaza disaster. They're demanding an increase in their minimum wage. Currently, the minimum wage in Bangladesh is lowest in the region of garment making countries. They're looking for almost a 100% increase. In 2023, the lowest monthly minimum wage for a garment worker in Bangladesh was around $98. Compare that to, say, Vietnam, $178, and in China and Cambodia, $274. Now, nothing stops a Canadian company from paying more than the minimum wage, but do they? This report from 2021 considered that very question. The Canadian Steelworkers Humanity Fund wanted to know how do Canadian clothing companies compare to the rest of the international brands manufacturing in Bangladesh? Our biggest finding was that workers working for Canadian brands are no better off than workers working for other brands. Sushmita Preetha is the researcher and author behind the findings. She spoke to 35 different workers in factories used by five iconic Canadian brands, 
including Loblaw owned Joe Fresh. I think the brands really need to stop their double standard. You know, I think they talk about commitment to workers' rights only as a PR strategy, you know, because they don't want their woke consumers to, to, have, to, to have to deal with the guilt of buying from sweatshops in Bangladesh. A living wage in Bangladesh, according to the Asian Floor Wage Alliance, is around 650 Canadian dollars a month. Workers in the Canadian factories from this study earn between 73 and $100 per month. Who, who are you directing your anger towards most in this equation? Maybe it's time for Canada to actually stand up and say, you know, we are the ones who will be fighting for a living wage for workers across supply chains. So I think it's important for consumers to know the real price of the, of the products that they're buying. The human price. The human price, yeah. We wanted to see that human price for ourselves. So we traveled to one of the biggest garment districts in Bangladesh. This is Savar, which is home to some 400 garment factories that employ half a million people. And we wanted to talk to some of them about wages and working conditions. But time and time again, they told us they were afraid. They felt by speaking out, they'd get fired. Until one brave woman came forward and said she'd talk. We came to this compound, where thousands of garment workers live. Down this small alley, where people are crammed into tiny rooms side by side. This is where we met Lazina Akhtar. Lazina, thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us. You came 300 kilometers from your, your own village to come here. Why did you want to work in a garment factory? Why not another job? The 24-year-old has been working at this factory for the last year and a half, making clothes for Joe Fresh. She works 11 hours a day, six days a week. And how much are you paid to make pants for Joe Fresh? On its website, Loblaw promises workers in its supply chain will get fair wages and the right to an adequate standard of living, including adequate food and nutrition, clothing and housing. This is my home. This is your home. Okay, thank you. But this is all Lazina can afford. A 10 by 10 cement room that she shares out of necessity with a roommate. Both sleeping on the floor. No mattress, no closets. So this is where you would uh, keep your food? No, no your, kitchen. Where do you cook? Where do you... So tell me, what's it like for you to live? Can you afford your costs? Can you afford your food, your, your, your home here? How do you get by? Lazina's story isn't unique. There are around 4 million garment workers in Bangladesh, about 65% of them women. Even the simple things in life, a luxury they can't afford. Do you have enough money to eat? I am not happy. You're not happy. In a statement, Loblaw says it supports the government's decision to significantly increase the minimum wage in the last 10 years, adding, we're extremely proud of what's been done to date and we continue to be part of the solution for the future. A couple of kilometers away from Lazina's cement room, the factory owners, 4,500 members represented by the BGMEA, the Garment Manufacturers Association. Headquartered in this brand new gleaming steel and glass building, complete with an infinity pool and a conference space that looks like the White House Situation Room. And is this Savar, the area? This is a suburb the area. And, and that's and got a lot of garment factories in Garment factories in this part, yeah. So 
This is your kingdom out here. Oh. <laughs> Farouk Hassan is a garment factory owner and the head of the BGMEA. I went to visit a worker. At the end of the month, she can barely afford enough food to eat. She's sleeping on a floor. She doesn't even have a mattress. Is this a way to, to treat somebody in a profitable industry? Is that fair? We are working on that. And I believe that what you have seen, uh, uh, you will not see in future because we are trying to make their salary, higher salary. But, but you've so been in business for years. This isn't like you, you just started this business. We should pay them so that they can perform, they can be happy with their wages so that they can work uh, happily because happy workers is a good worker. So ask yourself, do these look like happy workers? In November, after months of protests, the government increased the minimum wage to roughly $150 a month. Still more than $500 below what's considered a living wage in Bangladesh. Raising the question, who's really making the decisions here? Can you tell me how many politicians are also factory owners? I will say that uh, at least uh, 15. And do you see that as a conflict of interest? No, I don't think so. Why not? Because I mean, the government is influential in setting wages. I don't think so. It's a conflict of interest because they are doing uh, politics or they are serving the people. So that's a, a different area. But it's not just run-of-the-mill politicians in the garment business. Last year, that included the country's commerce minister, the state minister for foreign affairs, the finance minister, and the state minister for energy, all factory owners. Sushmita Prita also runs the opinion section of the country's most prominent English language newspaper. After the recent wage decision, she wrote a scathing column, writing, the wage board has put forth the same proposal as that of the owners, which makes the answer to the question of whose interests is the board really protecting painfully obvious. It is certainly a problem that factory owners have such sway over policymakers. One, because they, many of them have factories themselves, and, or two, because they're you know, really close to people in positions of power. The concern we've also heard is that if, fact, if workers are protesting, factory owners call the police and the police come out and they beat up the protesters. Normally, it is not happening here. I, I, can, I can assure you. Do you think it is safe in this current environment for, for workers to protest if they are angry? Or are they putting their lives in danger if they protest against a factory? Yeah, it is safe. The workers' fight for better wages took a deadly turn here. This is the Prince Jacquard Sweater Limited. They make name brands sold in Europe, the US and Canada. Workers here were protesting, demanding two months of back pay. A union organizer, Shahidul Islam, was brought in to try to negotiate a settlement. He had a meeting in here. He came out, he was attacked by a mob, kicked and beaten mercilessly. Hours later in hospital, the union activist was dead. In the months following his murder, four more workers were killed by police during protests. The law enforcement is an extension of factory owners. That should not be the case. The law enforcement should be there to protect the people of Bangladesh, not the factory owners of Bangladesh. We tried to contact workers for many weeks. Nobody wanted to talk to us. Why? Because they're afraid if they talk to us, they will be fired. Uh, I don't think so. It, I mean, no, no, it is, they are telling us this. This isn't my imagination. We don't have any blacklist system or we, do, we don't fire like, like that way because they have you think all the, the rights and all the rights they have. We learned after this interview, as many as 4,000 workers were fired for protesting, according to the labor organization, the Clean Clothes Campaign. 62 criminal cases were filed by factory owners and the police against 23,000 workers, sending many into hiding. 115 protesters have been detained, according to the Workers' Rights Consortium. 
But factory owners say don't blame them. Blame the powerful international brands who they say are putting the squeeze on owners and workers alike to make clothes for the cheapest possible price. They are not doing a fair pricing or ethical sourcing. Why not? Because they believe that they can, they can get more cheaper prices from Bangladesh and uh, that's why they always try to squeeze the prices on the head. When we come back... Shutrang Tara Jodi ek to dollar beshi diye product gulo nai. Ta hole sheta company jonno, company maha jonne jonno, amader moto hazaro shroom ke jonno, asha kori onik bhalo hobe. My name is Mark Kelly, I'm with the, the Fifth Estate. Rana Plaza collapsed a decade ago in Bangladesh. But the Canadian connection to the disaster still lives on. In 2013, as Bangladesh was mourning the loss of 1,134 lives, Joe Fresh was busy selling. The pitch, cheap and cheerful clothes, with an emphasis on cheap. So how much was a Joe Fresh t-shirt that year? As low as eight bucks. And how does that compare to today? Well, even in the face of today's inflation, a t-shirt can still sell for just over eight bucks. Convert that to 2013 dollars, and that's even less. So how is that possible? Right, I mean, this is a big question. The business model has to be changed. The business model? It's called the race to the bottom. Brands demand the cheapest price or else they take their business elsewhere. In the five years following the collapse of Rana Plaza, the price brands are willing to pay has actually gone down, on average, by 13%. While all other costs at the factory have gone up, power, materials, equipment, yet workers still live in poverty. You know, I spent already 32 years of my life in this sector, and I cannot wait for another 40 years to get living ways. We need living ways now, now, and the brand should be act now. In 2022, Kalpona actor came all the way to Toronto with her message, aimed directly at Joe Fresh. They are sourcing from our country. Two commitments we haven't had from them yet. One is transparency, the other is living with. It is more than a high time. She's not the only one trying to get the attention of Joe Fresh. We went to their headquarters to try to get an interview. My name is Mark Kelly, I'm with uh, the Fifth Estate. Oh, nice to see you. So we have been trying to get in touch with you mm -hmm. for a couple of weeks. Well, we have plenty of questions for Loblaw's Joe Fresh. Like what happened to all those promises to do better for the workers making their clothes in Bangladesh? 10 years ago, we requested an interview with Loblaw's CEO, Galen Weston. He declined. 10 years and all those promises later, we asked again, and he declined again. Instead, Loblaw sent us a statement. The relief and rebuild effort over the last 10 years has helped improve the lives of millions and the country's economy. As part of the effort, we have provided more than $5 million in compensation for the individuals and the families affected by the collapse of Rana Plaza. We remain committed to transparency and accountability in our global supply chain and continue to collaborate with stakeholders, factory partners, and industry organizations to drive positive change and protect the rights and well-being of workers where our products are made. As for the Accord, it may have been kicked out of Bangladesh. But now Canadian Brad Lowen has taken the proven safety inspection model to Pakistan. The International Accord is poised to expand to garment factories in Morocco, Sri Lanka and India. The fact that they're being welcomed in other countries speaks to the importance that people are putting on, on factory safety. As far as Bangladesh sort of moving away from the accord, kicking out, uh, and so yeah, that uh, took the course that it took.
for Lazina Akhtar, who struggles to get by working six days a week making clothes for Joe Fresh. She has a dream for something better. On her one day off a week, she's studying textile engineering at a local university. Her goal? To be a force for change as a leader in the garment industry. I want to see the country in Bangladesh. I want to see the the সেটা কোম্পানির জন্য কোম্পানির মহাজনের জন্য আমাদের মতো হাজারো শ্রমিকের জন্য আশা করি অনেক ভালো হবে বাট আ রিমেড ইন বাংলাদেশ গার্মেন্ট ইন্ডাস্ট্রি ওয়ন্ট হেল্প শুমি বিকজ অফ হার ইনজুরিজ শি সেজ শি ইজ টু স্লো টু মেক ফাস্ট ফ্যাশন এন্ড শি ইজ নাও প্রেগনেন্ট উইথ হার সেকেন্ড চাইল্ড অলদো শি রিসিভড এন ইনিশিয়াল কম্পেনসেশন পেমেন্ট অফ 12000 ডলারস Shumi still needs to pay about $1,200 each year to replace her prosthetic limb. That's almost the annual salary for a worker for clothes made in Bangladesh. I was <laughs> told that I was a little bit of 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 a little Shumi had never seen the documentary we made featuring her 10 years ago. So we showed it to her. It's the only time she smiled during our visit. A smile that quickly vanished when I asked her about her future. When I met you 10 years ago, you told me that when you were a child, you had dreams. You had dreams of a, of a big life. What, what are your dreams today? What would you like to say to Canadians?